Good morning, everyone. Just a few reminders before we start. First, we are requesting everyone to register online to receive updates from us. Second, if you have any questions or comments, please type them using the comments feature of YouTube. Third, when you type your comments or questions, please state your name and your organization. We encourage everyone to subscribe to the official YouTube channel by clicking the red subscribe button that you can see on your screen. Please also like and follow us in our official Facebook channel to be updated with the schedules of future webinars and other similar activities. Thank you. Aline, you now have the floor. Thank you so much. Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, honorable speakers, partners, participants, and committee of this online event. Welcome to the CMEO ALCU joint webinar on developing flexible and technology mediated learning programs. This program is aimed to provide more detailed information about the most effective and efficient process in developing flexible and technology mediated learning programs. First of all, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Alin Amanda, and please call me Alin. I am from CIMEO Regional Open Learning Center, or CIMOLEC, and I'm excited to be the moderator for today's event. So for the first agenda, we will have uh, the opening remarks from Dr. Rene Kolokar. Please, Dr. Rene, the, the floor is yours. Sorry, Dr. Rene Kolokar, are you ready? Okay, maybe while waiting for Dr. Rene, Dr. Ethel from CMEO Secretariat, do you have something to say to all participants and all the speakers, please? Good morning to all our 30,000 plus viewers who are joining us live and later today. Maybe I can say good afternoon and good evening. So we are very, very happy to do this uh, partnership with uh, ALCO. Uh, ALCO is very important in promoting accessible and quality education for all, especially at the community level. As you see, our community colleges, our local colleges and universities, uh, like in the Philippines, we have Pamantasan, uh, all of these uh, very important institutions, they contribute a lot on access and equity in education. And although they, they are really, you know, uh, forward looking in terms of their approach, but there are also challenges, especially uh, that we have this COVID-19 when uh, during COVID-19, we have around uh, almost, almost 190 countries with uh, not so good opportunity for, for flexible learning. We got lockdown, we got all the schools closed so we are very, very happy that today we'll be discussing solutions. So there are a lot of challenges, but there are also solutions. So I'm very, very happy that we will be having all our experts to talk about flexible learning modalities. So we have invited from all uh, over the region and also our partner, Korean Educational Development Institute, Dr. Kim, who will be sharing with us some information on how Korea responded to COVID-19 pandemic and that how do they address the access to education. So we will be talking about uh, a technology with high tech, low tech approach, and all of these opportunities where we can really contribute to quality education. So stay tuned and we hope to have you until the end of the session. Good morning, Sawadika from Bangkok. Okay, thank you, Dr. Etal. May I now check again to Dr. 
Uh, Rene Polokar, are you ready to deliver your opening remarks? Okay, if there, uh, I think there's still a technical problem with Dr. Rene, we may now proceed to our first uh, speaker. But before that, may I take your time to briefly explain about today's seminar. We will have uh, six experts to be the speakers and share their knowledge and uh, as well as their expertise related to the flexible and technology mediated learning programs. In sequence for presentation, they are the first one, Dr. Carlo Magno from the Philippines, the second, the second one, Professor Dr. Paulina Panen from Indonesia, the third one, Dr. Edison Fermin from the Philippines, and the fourth one, Associate Professor Kamalrat Interata from Thailand, the fifth one is Dr. Dean Tuan Long from Vietnam, and the last one, Dr. Hoon Yong Kim from KD Korea. So each of speakers will have uh, eight minutes to deliver their presentation materials, and we will have the question and answer session at the end of uh, for all speakers. Yeah. So without further ado, may I uh, call our first speaker, Dr. Carlo Magno. Uh, may I uh, briefly introduce him to you all? Uh, he is an ex officio president of the Philippine Educational Measurement and Evaluation Association. His specialized uh, area is on measurement, evaluation, and the analysis of test data, uh, particularly that of the item response theory. So uh, he is very active as a consultant to various Ministry of Education in developing countries like uh, Micronesia, Palau, Marshall Islands, and Samoa. So, Please, uh, Dr. Carlo Magno, you may have the floor now, sir. Okay. Um, good morning, everybody. Glad to speak for this particular session. Okay, let me um, share my screen now. Okay, so for this morning, I am um, going to present to you standards on flexible learning delivery this particular set of standards that i'm going to present would start on the idea on how we conceptualized it by breaking apart our understanding of what flexible learning is and towards some of the initiatives that we're actually um, going to do and uh, presently have accomplished in order to implement these particular standards so that it ensures effectivity of the delivery these are some of the points that we are going to um, talk about in my presentation. And I have converted these points into specific questions. The first point that we're going to answer in my presentation is, what are some of the different learning deliveries of flexible learning? And we provide a particular framework on how we understand these different modalities. The second one is, how do we ensure that flexible learning is actually delivered without quality and how do we now use the standards that we have developed what are some of these guidelines that needs to be set so that um, we understand key players in the delivery of flexible learning and how do we ensure that the roles are clear and it is adequately delivered last is a description on some of the initiatives that are done in the Philippines and done by our organization in order to implement flexible learning effectively. In order for us to understand on how we actually derive our standards on flexible learning is by first looking at how we actually understand what flexible learning is and how do we derive different modalities for flexible learning. We developed this particular model with two dimensions. The first dimension is actually on how we actually deliver the learning resources that runs on a continuum from an online delivery to an offline delivery mode. So when we say online delivery mode in the Philippines, these are ways on how we deliver the learning materials and instruction through the use of the internet. And when we say offline delivery in the Philippines, this would actually refer to printed modules and um, televisions and radio signals. The second dimension on how we understand flexible learning is the distance of the learner away from the school setting, which runs in a continuum from face to face to distance or remote learning where the learner is away from the school setting. This gives us about four quadrants on how we actually approach various flexible learning delivery modes. Q1, which is quadrant one, and Q3, which is 
quadrant three are the usual things that happen inside our classroom face to face and there's technology integration when there is online available in the school setting and our traditional practice face to face where students make use of print materials and the teachers make use of visuals that are posted on the board inside the classroom this is your usual q3 um, the existing challenge now is how do we actually deliver modalities that belongs in Q2 and Q4, the second quadrant and the fourth quadrant. The, the second quadrant entails that there's still technology integration because the learning materials are delivered making use of online mode. And there's blended learning because there's now a combination of the teacher presenting a synchronous and synchronous type of learning the teacher is present online and some of these materials where the student will have to independently study on their own is actually facilitated by the parents. The fourth quadrant is much challenging because of a large number of students, especially in the public schools in the Philippines, about 80%, according to some survey, is that they do not have online access. So Q4 is very much applicable for them, where the student is away from the school and the learning material is actually provided to them through a print module. There is actually a large uh, uh, amount of materials that they have to go through and the role of the parents is um, very much needed here because the parents will have to build a culture of learning in the homes, the parents will have to monitor the study habits of the learner, and varied teaching and learning approaches is actually done by the parents and other community um, volunteers in order to facilitate the learning of the child. The teacher can also play an important role here by looking at the progress of the child through various modes, such as home visitation, and um, looking at the sample works of the learner. Now, the question is, since this is mostly a widespread implementation of flexible learning across countries in Asia, a pressing question is, how do we actually know that flexible learning delivery will make students learn? How do we actually ensure that the students will progress towards the learning target? Many initiatives, many plans, and many policies have actually been set already, and these plans would have to be looked at on how effective we actually deliver these particular plans. And the effectivity of looking into these plans is how do we translate these policies, practices, and initiatives into student performance. Therefore, we need to look at how flexible learning actually optimizes student performance, especially um, inside the classroom and in various learning delivery modes. The answer to this particular question is simple. If we want to know, whether flexible learning delivery will actually make our students learn inside the classroom, we need to continuously gather evidences of student performance through assessment for flexible learning. In the idea of assessment for flexible learning, if we want the teaching and the learning delivered in a flexible learning delivery mode, so as assessment, so the idea is that if we concentrate on the teaching and learning process as a flexible learning delivery, therefore assessment needs to be integrated with it because assessment provides us evidence whether students are actually going to learn and benefit from this approach. Now, let me start off first with the idea briefly on assessment for flexible learning, then we go to the standards. The idea of assessment for flexible learning is derived from the original idea of assessment for learning. In the idea of assessment for learning, we're now making use of assessment to make students want to learn. We use assessment results to improve instruction. We use assessment to support students to achieve our learning targets. Um, these learning targets comes in a different variety depending on our curriculum framework. We, in the Philippines for the K-12, we call them the learning competencies. In higher education institutions, we call them as our course outcomes, or sometimes we call them as our objectives. In the new um, perspective that we're introducing, such as assessment for flexible learning, we're adding two important components to make the idea of learning coming out through the use of informed evidences about what students can do and cannot do. 
these two important ideas that we're adding in the concept of assessment for flexible learning is number one, we need to make quality assessment accessible at various modes of instructional delivery. Making sure that assessment happens, making sure that assessment is an integral part of the teaching and the learning process across various flexible learning delivery modes is very important. And how this is actually conducted, even when it is done online or offline. The second is we have to ensure that the teaching and the learning aspect of flexible learning will have to include assessment and the assessment is delivered with that of quality. Meaning to say there should be various stakeholders involved so that we can see results of assessment so that assessment becomes usable. Now we have adopted our original two dimensional framework on assessment for learning. And how do we now plug in practices on assessment for flexible learning across the four quadrants? Let me focus on the second quadrant and the fourth quadrant. In an online delivery mode with distant learning, it's very much feasible to have good assessment. You can do assessment before, during, and after instruction. You can even have a larger scope of assessment when you want to evaluate how effective the entire flexible learning program is in the institution by providing an assessment before the beginning of the school year and use this information to make some improvements towards the end of the school year. Sorry, Online, Dr. Milo, you have on, one more minute for your presentation. I'm sorry. Uh, one more minute. Yes. Okay. Um, online delivery. Okay. And um, it can also be conducted in um, community based. Okay. Um, let me now go through the succeeding slides. When you say aspects of quality implementation of assessment, it's very important that we have to realize that it is our obligation to, and uh, it is our responsibility to ensure that flexible learning will work. Therefore, we need these particular standards to ensure that the quality delivery of flexible learning is actually provided. And it, we need to ensure that flexible learning will be effective based on our implementation and in order to do that we need to follow specific set of standards and um, when i share these particular slides later on you just click on this particular button so that you will be able to um, see the aspects of the standard so generally the standards is composed of four we have standards on how we develop the learning resources it's very important on how the learning materials are actually designed so that it will make the learners engage in the learning, whether it's printed mode or online mode. Second is that it's very important for how, how effective these printed modules and these online modules are actually delivered, how this is facilitated by the parents and the teachers. It's very important also that we need to clarify what are the specific roles of the parents, the guardians, tutors, and the teacher when it comes in to the delivery of flexible learning in various places where the learner is. And it's very important later on to look at data, information, to see whether we're actually delivering quality standard learning through monitoring and evaluation. Now, in the Philippine setting, these are some of the initiatives that are done on flexible learning delivery for the private schools. These are some of the plans and for the higher education institutions. Okay, um, here's just some of the snapshots that, uh, that some of the initiatives that our organization did. We actually um, had a session with various administrators from, pub, uh, from both public and private schools and we were able to reach about 51 schools and we trained them on how to set up flexible learning delivery in their schools. And then um, we have implemented also the flexible learning delivery mode for um, implementing it for the guidance program. And we taught school administrators on how to come up with flexible learning delivery plans and then to disseminate it to their stakeholders, such as parents, so that parents will have a good grasp on how flexible learning is going to be delivered. And we have partnered with two schools, so we have trained the parents on how to teach reading instruction, and we have assisted uh, PTAs in schools on how to actually collect summative assessment because this is very much needed because this is graded. And um, lastly, I'd like to uh, thank my team. Okay, they're my co-authors in developing the standards, and uh, I'll just post later on the link on where you can actually derive the standards. I'd like to acknowledge my team, Miss Nicole Factuar. 
Ms. Delma Robles, Ms. Um, Paula Jean Bulilan, and Mr. Arvin J. Forto for the brainstorming on arriving with this set of standards. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Carlo, for the very insightful presentation, yeah, for sharing with us about the setting in the Philippines. I believe the material you shared has been uh, very insightful for participants. Uh, now, before we go to the next speaker, may I call Dr. Rene Kolokar, the president of ALCO Philippines, to deliver the opening remarks. Please, sir. All right, thank you to our moderator. Uh, first, uh, my apology. I, I, I encountered some connectivity problem a while ago. So that's exactly the problems of different AGI in the Philippines. In fact, uh, connectivity problem. Nevertheless, uh, for in behalf of the Association of Local Colleges and Universities in the Philippines, we would like to extend our heartfelt appreciation to Simeo, of course, through Dr. Ether Valenzuela and the Simeo technical staff for allowing ALCO to be part of this very significant undertakings, the joint webinar of both Simeo, ALCO, ALCO, OWA, Philippines. Uh, most uh, government all over the world have temporarily closed academic institution in an attempt to control and mitigate the spread of coronavirus disease 2019 or COVID-19 pandemic. Based on the latest data of the UNESCO Institute for Statistics, 144 countries have implemented localized schools closure, impacting the 1,186,127,211 learners, which is equivalent to around 67.7% of the total enrolled learners. Due to this severe disruption in education, teaching and learning process is now moving from traditional face-to-face -to, -face to online class in an unprecedented measure and with a lot of trial and error in probability for the teachers and the learners. Moreover, these are also felt by many families around the world, home schooling challenges, the parents or guardians productivity as well as the children's learning and social life. These interferences in education might just seem a short-term issue, but we will look closely at the emerging situation. This might also have long-term consequences. With that, immediate responses shall be imperatively planned and taken. The school closure rushed the significant demand to institutionalize alternative modalities to guarantee the learning still continues amidst this pandemic. In the Philippines, flexible learning is seen as best option and is now being talked about among educational institutions through webinar sessions. Flexible learning is basically customizing an institution pace, place, and mode of learning. With pace, for example, learners may engage in part-time learning to ensure the safety and to minimize, to minimize their use of resources. Learning can take place in various settings, including the classroom or at home through the internet connection. While mode refers to the way the content is delivered using technology, typically through blended learning, fully online classes or technologically enhanced experiences. In light of this, the Association of Local Colleges and Universities of the Philippines and the Association of Local Colleges and Universities Commission on Accreditation together with the general membership recommended to the Board of Regents or Board of Trustees of Local Colleges colleges and universities through a joint advisory. The implementation of seamless blended digital learning program during the second semester and summer of academic year 2019 and 20. This is in line with advisories issued by the Commission on Higher Education, providing guidelines for the prevention of the spread of COVID-19 in higher education institutions. The advisory highlights some organizational intervention such as the conduct of free webinars and other virtual learning activities for LCU top officials, college dean, faculty, and staff. And just this June, Alcocolo launched the search for the most agile and resilient LCU, where all LCUs are encouraged to submit a comprehensive transition plan, including the SBD learning program to be implemented. As local colleges and universities are now intensively preparing for the upcoming academic year, this joint webinar of Semeyo and ALCO and ALCO-COA is a great avenue 
for the speakers and participants to share ideas and experiences on the development of flexible and technologically mediated learning program for the local colleges and universities. With the available technology and ICT infrastructure challenges, institutionalizing such program is really a significant matter to deal with. Let us also expect that the emergence of the new hybrid education system will result to new outcomes that LCUs must be ready of. Considering the utilization of online teaching and learning, there is possibility that flexible learning might be further accelerated and that technology mediated learning might eventually become an integral part of Philippine education. With the unclear future that this pandemic might bring, by working together, we can come up with effective learning programs that will enable our students to receive the quality education they deserve and the assurance of safety during this crisis. Thank you, and let us claim the success of this joint initiative of Sameyo, Alku, and Alcocoa. Good day or good evening to everyone. God bless us all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Anna Kolokar, for your wonderful remarks. Uh, we are now moving on to our second speaker. Uh, she is Professor Dr. Paulina Panen from Indonesia. Uh, she is an expert in higher education, e-learning, distance education, educational technology, and curriculum development. Uh, she has over 30 years of experience in national and international education, the chairman of several task force on higher education quality development, including the development of Indonesian MOOCs. Uh, she was actually my previous boss in Simio Simolek. <laughs> Hello, Ibu. Good luck for today's presentation. Now may I hand uh, over the session to you, please. Ibu, can you turn on your sound, your audio? Okay. Oh. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you okay. clearly now. Okay, I can share my content now. Is it okay? Yes, you can see it clearly. Okay, Please. thank you. Thank you, everybody. And uh, good morning to all of you. Uh, I'm delighted that I'm invited by Dr. Ethel and Sim Simio family to be uh, one of the panelists today. Uh, it has been a long time for me to be with all of you. Some of you may have known me for, I don't know, more than a decade. <laughs> it's a nice reunion in the morning. Uh, however, very fruitful uh, reunion, I think. Uh, the uh, what you call the introduction, uh, welcome remarks from uh, Dr. Rene uh, Kolokar has been enlightening us all and saying that uh, actually the the challenge is not only uh, particular to Philippines. It's also uh, to every one of us in the ASEAN countries and perhaps in the global world also. However, uh, Indonesia, I think, uh, feels almost similar to what Philippines is experiencing right now. And we have taken also some measures uh, to answer to the challenge. Okay, uh, we are going to talk about the flexible and technology-mediated learning program. And uh, may I know, uh, may I start with uh, explanation about Indonesian policy just prior to the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, actually, we have already a new policy that is providing freedom for learning at uh, school level as well as higher education. And we define the teachers as school level as change agent and then the campus in higher education as freedom campus so actually we are we were already moving toward what we called uh, 
what we call uh, flexible learning just prior to the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And we took advantage at that time with the technology uh, development based on the industrial revolution like robotic, uh, artificial intelligence, internet of things to be implemented in schools as well as campuses. However, we were uh, shocked kind of shock, great shock uh, by the COVID-19 pandemic. And actually it was a blessing because uh, the COVID-19 pandemic pushed forward the policy, both at the school level and higher education level into practices. And uh, at the extreme level, the practice is not in campus, it's not at the school, uh, but uh, at home for every student. We also uh, face another challenge from the uh, learning process uh, theory, uh, especially Michael Fulan has been uh, very prolific during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. And I'm using his uh, Mobius ribbon to explain or to uh, illustrate how actually in our uh, uh, children's right now, the millennials, uh, we call it, uh, to learn play and research produce or do or work all together at the same time. They don't uh, differentiate learning by itself, playing by itself or doing things uh, differently. They put everything together, they learn while they play and while they are doing something. So the, uh, everything is just uh, put together uh, without any limitation of stopping point. Uh, there is no stopping point. They learn, they play, they research, and they produce or do something, and they learn, they play, they do something again. Something like that. So every time uh, their learning process is just totally different from us, who, uh, who are experiencing a very sequential uh, process, learning first, playing at home, and then do something later on when you are uh, doing uh, homework or something like that. So. It's totally different uh, picture of le learning process now with our millennials. And uh, based on that, uh, actually the new learning process is already moving forward, uh, introducing the individual learning, online learning, small group learning on collaborative learning, like the, the one that I put in a picture and based on uh, the use of technology. However, during the COVID-19 pandemic, the teacher-led small group instruction was cut off. So the, the most uh, modality uh, being used during the COVID-19 pandemic is online learning, personalized online learning, and also individual learning and collaborative learning being online as well as uh, small or what we call uh, very limited uh, meetings. Uh, two or three children together uh, within the same uh, approximity or areas. But uh, the teacher-led small group instruction is all gone. However, the use of uh, technology is very increasing. Uh, after the COVID-19 pandemic, we are with a new development of uh, learning, actually. Uh, I put uh, the seven principles here. And the seven one is the, the one uh, developed uh, after the COVID-19 pandemic, what we call it is less contact, not contract, less contact learning. So it is not new, no contact, but it is lesser contact learning. Yeah, uh, the contact is reduced somehow to uh, maintain the safety uh, protocol. So based on that, actually the most uh, what we call the most popular uh, new learning process has been what we call the flip learning. Uh, we are flipping the traditional uh, procedures of uh, teaching and learning at school, something like this, into something like this. So the teacher or the lecturer will produce material so that the students will view it at home. And then uh, if they go to the classroom activities, 
they will discuss the material. So no more lecturing, no more uh, teaching, uh, one way teaching from the teachers. Uh, and then the principles are higher level of learning, out of class activities, instructor facilitates students, activities focus learning, learning is collaborative and connects with uh, instructor, the students and the use of technology. However, the classroom activities was replaced during the COVID-19 with learning from home. Everything can be done from home. And this kind of uh, habit actually will be the new habit, what we call the new learning in the new normal situation. That is one extreme. The other extreme is the project-based learning. Flexible learn, uh, flip learning is more of a teacher's driven, still teacher driven, but the project-based learning is more the students driven. So if uh, the teacher uh, provide learning guide, students workbook practice and practicum guide, and then the students can do their own project, uh, inquiry based, fun, active interaction and collaborative. They can do active learning. They can later on, after they do the, the learning and the project, they can exhibit and present their, pro, uh, their result. And to indicate mastery, the, the teacher will assess uh, based on the peer assessment and also based on the teacher assessment. And then they will provide feedback. So the, the project-based learning is on the other hand, on the other side of the uh, flip learning, which is flip learning is teacher driven. The project-based learning is uh, more student driven. And if you see the, the use of uh, technology, actually flip learning is more of technology based, but project-based learning is uh, reducing the, the use of technology somehow because they don't need to be uh, present uh, to be present at a uh, video conference all the time they can uh, have the the time of their own to do the project based on the learning guidance or the student workbook so uh, the minimal use of technology you can find uh, you can find in project based learning this is very useful, especially answering to Dr. Carlos' uh, issues just now, saying that not all the, the students have access to technology, the quadrant four situation. Uh, as much as we want to use the technology, uh, we use robot, we use VR, etc., and then we use a video conferencing like this, but it is not the technology actually that matters. It is not what or how many technology you use, but how you use it. Because what matters to us educators is learning. Whether or not if you are using flip classroom, learning taking place. Whether or not if you are using project-based learning, learning is taking place. Uh, and then how you use the, the technology is to equip you to assist you as educators to provide cognitive presence to the students, to provide social presence to the students. They are being touched, they are being connected to you, and also to provide a learning presence with, within the classroom. But the students, of course, like Dr. Uh, Rene uh, said, that the student can just study anytime, anywhere, and with anybody collaborating. So once again, it is the learning that matters, not the technology. And with that, I come to uh, nine points of remark. Uh, this technology base, especially pushed forward by the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, is actually opening up uh, learning, uh, become unbundled, become multi-mode, become multi-channel, so there is no more uh, what we call uh, stigmatization of uh, school. School is the only one source. No, it is accessible. It is more flexible to anyone. And then also we, we notice that uh, only good pe pedagogy, which will work, uh, this, the teacher will, will have to use uh, good pedagogy in 
uh, guaranteeing in making sure that uh, the learning is taking place wherever uh, the students is. Sometimes the teacher will have to do uh, door to door, uh, what do you call, a uh, visit to the students if they don't access, don't have access to computer or internet. But still, they have to make sure the teacher have to make sure that the learning taking place. And then the other thing is that uh, while we are doing flip learning or project based learning, actually we educators notice that we cannot walk alone, we cannot work alone. We need somebody to assist us, uh, so that uh, it can be you know uh, developing the course, developing the program can be a collaborative effort actually among teachers among teachers with also technical uh, expertise in uh, IT, for example. Uh, so we will have to work in uh, a team also. And then the other thing is that uh, we are no longer uh, tuned on the approach of uh, one-way teaching, uh, teacher to the students, and then content delivery, whether the curriculum is completed or not, uh, and then summative assessment, but more of constructivist pedagogical approaches, especially when you are using the uh, project-based learning. That is more constructivist where the students can construct their own project, doing the project, and then later on construct their knowledge. And then uh, number five is that uh, acceleration towards blended and online learning, whether you like it or not, now it is more than ever blended and online learning everywhere. And then the face-to-face -face teaching is very reduced into minimal. And then the other thing is that if you have uh, students, whether you like it or not, at the quarter four, according to Dr. Carlo, uh, who doesn't have access to internet or computer, then you have to have a, what I call a differentiated strategy. And, and that uh, requires a very good pedagogy and instructional design on the hands of the teacher. And then we, we see right now that since the meeting is not in the classroom where the teacher is the uh, authority of the classroom, uh, there is an increased sharing power of students and teachers, especially with the guidelines uh, provided by the teacher. The students can do their project on their own, on their own pace, on their own time, with their own strategy. And this leads to autonomous learning. And then there is also commitment of equity and access across of our institution, as especially the government, I believe. That is what Dr. Rene just now mentioning to us. And then also increase acceptance that the role of institution and educators as a source of care, not a source of information anymore. So everything we, we preach prior to the COVID-19, it's happening in the COVID-19 pandemic, during the COVID-19 pandemic, and it will continue as the new normal for all of us in education uh, sector and uh, especially in Indonesia, I would say, and also I believe in uh, many other countries in ASEAN. With that, thank you very much. Uh, I hope this will be a good discussion follow up. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Paulina. It was a wonderful sharing from you. Uh, before we move on to the next speaker, we have two questions for the first two uh, speakers, Dr. Carlo and Professor Paulina. Operator, please, if you may display the two questions for our first two speakers. So this one is for Dr. Carlo. Can you give us details on how to administer assessment to children in different levels, especially in elementary grades from okay. so Sharon, Pascual, and other participants? Please. Okay, so it's actually going to be a little bit challenging and many stakeholders are involved when you actually conduct assessment for, especially for the lower grades. Now, for the lower grades, it will actually depend on whether assessment is done as formative or summative. For formative assessment, there's actually a little degree of control, but when we conduct 
summative assessment, there's actually a higher degree of control for the lower levels. Now, if it's going to be an online formative assessment, usually it's integrated already in the learning management system where feedback and answer keys are provided. And when the formative assessment is a performance based task, the participants can actually, the students can actually um, record their performance when it is a procedure. And it can actually be viewed by the teacher online or when they actually record the process, they can actually upload that process and the teacher will have a good opportunity for feedback. However, if it's going to be an offline through a print module, formative assessment will have a corresponding answer key coming from the parent or from the tutor, where after the learner is able to accomplish this particular task, a tutor or a parent or an adult who's facilitating the learning of the child will actually have to um, do the checking and provide some feedback and process the mistakes so that revision, so that another chance is actually provided for the child. When, when we're doing now the summative assessment online, same procedure is actually done. However, a much degree of control is actually needed because summative assessments are now graded. Um, one way is to have a video monitoring if it's done online where the teacher can actually see what is going on while the learner is actually accomplishing the summative assessment online task. It's now going to be challenging if the learner does not have any internet access. When doing summative assessments at home, okay, so usually these summative assessment tasks are printed and the child accomplishes this summative assessment form. Very clear guidelines need to be set with the parent or the adult who is actually supervising the learning of the child on what they should do in order to monitor the child while the child is actually accomplishing the summative assessment task, like ensuring that the child is not provided with the answer, not opening references when they're actually accomplishing tasks. This can actually be solved by providing open-ended questions rather than um, questions that are um, close-ended with responses so that you can see uniqueness of the answer of every child. When a product is produced in a performance task, these products can actually be sent to the teacher. Drop boxes are provided on specific zonal locations where the students can actually submit their work there and it's collected by the teacher. And um, feedback is sent to the child through a printed note on how they can actually improve their work. Generally, this can actually be solved by a school uh, where they need to provide a specific set of guidelines on what the parents should do every time formative and summative assessments are actually done. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Dr. Carlo, for the answer to our first question. It was brief but comprehensive. So now we are moving on to the next question. This one is for Professor Paulina. What are the strengths and weaknesses of the flexible learning course? The question from Ms. Adora Kulbas. Thank you. Thank you, Ali. And thank you for the question, Adora. I think uh, that is a very uh, good question and very spot on. Uh, in my opinion, the, the strength of flexible learning is because it gives freedom, actually, uh, for everyone, for the students, as well as also for the teachers, and sometimes also for the parents. Okay. Uh, however, uh, we notice the strength, uh, the, the uh, weaknesses that is, uh, as, as, as you know, with, uh, with freedom usually comes responsibility. Now, it is not easy for us, the, uh, what you call the uh, educators, to push on uh, students being responsible. Like, for example, if you are supposed to be meeting uh, uh, via uh, video conference at 8 in the morning, sometimes the students are not there, not all of them. Suppose you, are, uh, uh, have, you have to do the homework, uh, but on your own. And what they do is just calling all the, uh, uh, the teachers and the friends every time. Uh, this happened uh, based on the research in Indonesia. And later on, they found out that uh, being uh, free uh, at home, uh, studying at home is not nice. They miss the teachers, they miss also the, uh, the friends. So uh, 
uh, yes, there is uh, for me, for example, an independent uh, person like me. I love uh, flexible learning very much so that I can manage my own time, etc. However, for students, actually, uh, they need more than uh, what we call not uh, more than uh, being left alone. So that's why the what we call the um, guidance actually uh, from teacher is very much needed. So that's that's my uh, uh, answer, and and especially. If, if you want to take uh, more control from teachers, because uh, in flexible learning, the, the control from teachers is very much less. Uh, actually, uh, you can use uh, what the, the children like uh, right now is game. Using game in learning, if you can uh, ask teachers to do gaming, that can, uh, what we call, uh, that can teach the students with uh, a lot of responsibility because game and artificial intelligence can be embedded with our uh, kind of uh, disciplines uh, and all the requests that we would like to have uh, controlling the students actually but uh, to know that the students can do it on their own uh, can do it with uh, responsibility and they can do it anywhere but still, you have to have your telephone on uh, because they will they will uh, call you anytime. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Paulina, uh, for your answer to our next uh, our second question. Yeah, it was very enlightening. So before I hand the session to our next speakers, uh, to all participants, I'd like to encourage you to share today's webinar with your social networks so you can take a screenshot of this webinar session and share it or post them directly on your Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook accounts. So we can make this uh, webinar become even uh, bigger and wider yeah, in our next sessions. So currently we have 35, more than 35,000 viewers, if I'm not mistaken, in our MCMEO Secretariat YouTube accounts. Very impressive. So now uh, may I uh, introduce you to our third speaker from the Philippines, Dr. Edison Fermin. He is the Vice President for Academic Affairs of the National Teachers College in Manila, Philippines. Prior to this, his extensive work uh, covered curriculum, instruction, and leadership in basic, basic education. Uh, so, Dr. Edison Fermin, without further ado, the floor is yours. Sir. Thank you so much, Aline, and thank you so much for having me here today. I hope that everyone can see my screen now. And what I hope to do is to clarify my points within the next uh, eight or 10 minutes. I came from the National Teachers College built on nine decades of building the nation education. And it took us only nine days to transition to flexible learning. The rapidness of all these changes is impacting upon the kind of changes that we want to facilitate in most of our educational institutions and the cases that have been shared so far articulate that it's not an easy uh, journey in the in the hopes of finding ways by which institutions may be helped out we are in search for definitions to begin with and currently at the commission on higher education we are adopting a definition that allows several voices in flexible learning and education to be heard. And what we have right now is a definition you're seeing on the screen. Flexible learning is the design and delivery of entire degree programs, specific courses within degree programs, or interventions that are suitable to specific learners. But we need to be mindful of learners' needs in terms of pace, place, process, and products covering only the most essential experiences, content, and outcomes, just being mindful equally of the role of learner control and customizability. So allow me to describe to you what we have done at the institutional and probably what most institutions in the Philippines have been doing over the past few weeks. Of course, there's still that great need to pay attention to the kind of learning outcomes that are rooted in institutional priorities. But I say that more importantly, we should now be connecting with the industries 
that are largely affected by the pandemic. We need to be mindful of how those requirements are going to change because they are supposed to also feed into our learning outcomes ecosystem. Only after that can we make decisions on the pace, place, process, and products of learning. Take note that these four considerations will need to be understood carefully by institutions in their attempt to look for viable solutions. If we look at pace, you could either look at the teacher leading both synchronous or asynchronous experiences, or we really put more emphasis on the learners taking charge, where you have two dimensions of self-paced learning. One is fully independent, and the other one is guided in some form. In terms of place, of course, we can think about residential types of learning if and when quarantine measures have, uh, have been configured. And that would mean that we, it's a toss between the classroom or specific sites of training and education. Or we can do a distance or remote, and there are two ways of looking at these options. Either you look at wired options or non-wired options. In between, you can think about blended learning modalities, and that is okay. But of course, that will be contingent on many considerations. In terms of processes, I'm looking at at least the modular set of processes where you get to prepare real printed materials that students can interact with, or if not, their digital version. Or you can do also simulative learning, particularly for courses that demand a lot of laboratory-based learning experiences. And that is why under simulative flexible learning, there could still be lab or job-based learning or remote simulations using artificial intelligence and simulation software available online. But if you ask me, simulative learning can also still happen by or through the provision of do-it-yourself learning kits that may be sent like modules to students. Mm -hmm. And by products, while Dr. Magno and um, our earlier speaker from uh, Indonesia have mentioned about the use of formative and summative assessments, which can done via manual or automated means, I would say that we must also think about non-traditional assessments, which look at actual performance-based assessments documented by students in one way or another, or uh, you could take a look at some forms of reflective assessments, which I'm going to deal with in a little while. In the search of some way for you to remember my inputs today, coming from my personal, professional, and institutional experience, I have thought about the word simio. And I hope that the simio secretariat will uh, be able to approve this uh, acronym of some sort. I have six things that I would want to share with the rest of the people in this school to make flexible learning happen. And I will discuss each of them in a little while. Let's begin with student-centeredness. Each institution will have to be mindful of at least three categories of learning, of learners rather, who are at work at the moment. So they are categories one to three, talking about the extent to which each learner is connected in some form to the school or a learning platform or any delivery provider for the continuity of education. We need to be mindful of this because equitable access is an important issue. And by equitable access, each institution will have to carefully choose from a variety of both wired and non-wired options. In the literature of flexible learning and education systems, you will find that there are at least 10 known wired options to facilitate flexible learning and about seven for non-wired options. If you look at the non-wired options, some of these have been in existence prior to COVID-19. It's just that, we need to be mindful how they can be uh, adjusted relative to the conditions that we are facing right now. I'd like to pay attention to project-based learning, deliver-on-demand learning kits, and course supermarkets among the non-wired options. Because these three uh, currently are being explored by a lot of countries now migrating towards uh, a lesser form or a more um, a more enabling form of quarantine measures in which students can really choose what to learn at a given time without necessarily having to follow a very rigid and structured curriculum. To me, this is the future that flexible learning is going to open when students can really decide for themselves where they will begin, what kind of content and experience they will have to go through on their own 
or under the guidance of certain adults or significant others. But the rest are known options already available to all of us. But where would institutions, educators, families, and communities base much of their decision on? I would say in the reconfiguration of teaching and learning processes, it must be emphasized that we cannot operate on the same set of learning outcomes prior to COVID-19. I'd say that we concentrate only on outcomes that are easy to monitor and measure, and therefore are quite realistic for both teachers and learners to manage, even in remote conditions. Of course, we think that there's still a need for them to acquire or access content, but I would say that more than content, we need to design appropriate and developmentally appropriate and meaningful remote learning experiences that allow for students to see themselves as owners of the learning process and those experiences are necessarily anchored on content but the way i define content must be content that is an inch long but a mile deep so that means to say that we only concentrate on what needs to be known at the moment because we cannot assume that all learners have access to resources um, at home or wherever they are right now. While online learners will have access to a myriad of choices for content, we must be mindful that the greater majority will still have access to little amount of content. And if we keep that in mind, equitable access is guaranteed. Also, I'd like us to uh, when we are transitioning to the new normal right now, before we were talking about the mix of knowledge, skills, and attitudes constituting a learning outcome that's insofar as, as our Ministry of Higher Education is concerned in the Philippines. But if we talk about anything and everything connected to the pandemic from the lens of our discipline, subjects, or courses at the moment, I think we will make the most of the pandemic to teach three important R's. And yes, they are not your reading, writing, and arithmetic, but the three, the three R's of the 21st century, namely reasoning, resilience, and responsibility. I am very positive that if we bring into the learning experiences of the students the kind of news, the kind of changes that they are dealing with relative to the pandemic, we can enrich and expand the horizon of their appreciation of remote learning because this is the time when we need to talk about adversity as an opportunity for learning. And take note, each of these three new R's can be driven by our transversal skills of creativity, critical thinking, and connection. I would like us to engage more students in reflective assessments. I am for measuring learning outcomes, but at the moment, we need to address as well the limitations of traditional formative and summative assessments and all the considerations of people uh, working with children, especially on the integrity of assessment processes. If you look at the screen right now, I am showing you an alternative assessment we created for one of our degree programs in information and communications technology. This already serves as the terminal assessment of the students who are wanting to become future computer scientists and ICT specialists. If you notice, the context is the COVID-19 crisis. The content that they have to access would be the knowledge, skills, and attitudes that constitute ICT as a discipline, but the direction is to solve an issue, to exercise reasoning, resilience, and responsibility in order that they can make use of their discipline as a way of addressing this current adversity and future adversities. This is what I mean by engaging in reflective learning assessments and experiences. It's also going to be useful if institutions of learning, whether you are in the primary, secondary, or tertiary education, or even graduate education, to think about what kind of communication lines will have to be open to students parents, teachers, community members, even the janitors and the other staff members of the institution. In my case, our case, at the National Teachers College, we began to introduce, during March, the Enhanced Student Academic Engagement Arrangement, 
our focus was to open lines for the continuity of academic engagement. But we realized immediately after that, that cannot be the case. We need to open communication lines with other offices that provide student services. That's why we transitioned to adaptive community for the continuity of education and student services. In summary, I would like to propose that for everyone in this school, the direction toward flexible learning as far as our institutions are concerned would be that we consider student-centeredness as key and equitable access as a guiding principle and where our justice must focus only on what is essential being so that we can also look at the pandemic as the content and context of instruction where reflective assessments are going to be useful in order that our students can make better sense of their rapidly changing environment but they can only do this if they have guarantee that they can communicate with as many providers of service and nurturance possible I'd like to end by saying that right from the very beginning, Simeo has figured out the formula for education, both in normal times in adversity. The Simeo song tells us, it's time to open our eyes, a bright and promising future, we'll rise to the call of the times and create a stronger tomorrow. Mabuhay, salamat, and may the spirit of collaboration guide all the member countries of Simeo. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Edison, for your wonderful presentation. It was very enlightening. Uh, just a little info before we go to our next speaker. If you have any questions or comments to a specific speaker or to all of the speaker, please type them into the comment box in YouTube. The committee will try to screen some good questions, and I will bring them up during the question and answer sessions. So now I am pleased to invite our next speakers from Thailand, Associate Professor Kamal Rat in Taratat. She is currently being chair and founder of the International Online Program for ASEAN Communication under the Faculty of Communication of STOU, Sukhothai Ratopan University in Thailand. And her focus is uh, the development communication, especially in the community-based based communication. So now, without further ado, may I hand over the session to you, please. Swadi ka. Yes, uh, Swadi from Bangkok, Thailand. Uh, we are very honored to, to join this uh, Simio Forum and especially the fantastic topic of flexible learning that is uh, embedded by technology. So. Uh, on behalf of our STOU, Sukhothai Tamatila Open University, actually we have done a lot of flexible learning to serve all the group of people uh, in, in Thailand uh, and also in the region of ASEAN. So the, let's see that, how could we do that? Uh, in case of our design of flexible learning, uh, we normally uh, we normally decide uh, the the flexible learning that serve the fundamental de demand of the of our people. So the once we decide the education, we have to make sure that uh, uh, all the basic demand of their life can be fulfilled by our our education. So first we we have uh, decide the uh, education that can serve the living, they can earn a job, they can earn a living, and then they can access to information that is uh, in, uh, 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 important to their life. And then finally, they can be somebody that stand by their own if they can uh, get that education. So this is uh, how that uh, we decide flexible learning in our uh, university kind of. So let's share you with some of the example that uh, we have designed our flexible learning that uh, you mentioned at the earlier that uh, uh, how can we use technology to embed it or to facilitate any kinds of education from the high end to the low end, from the, the high end technology from the high so to low so kind of that. So let me start by the example of uh, our university working with the, the national platform of, uh, of Thailand that uh, we call Thai MOOC. Thai MOOC is the national single knowledge platform that is the 
uh, authorized by the Thai government to use technology to uh, deliver any kinds of education to all the Thai people, but mostly it's more on in the university base. So this is the one that we work with them. Uh, our university is a partner of this uh, national knowledge platform also, but in the sake of uh, more on the lifelong education, alternative education kind of that. And then the, once the Thai MOOC uh, is more on university based, so the, the platform is a little bit uh, uh, difficult to access to our out school people, to uh, some of the marginalized people. So the, our university by the expertise research center has designed more simplified platform. So this is called, uh, we transform from the Thai MOOC to be the smart MOOC. So this one is a moderate, moderate uh, uh, educational platform to, to simplify the accessibility and affordability to all the group of people in Thailand to access to education for their earn a living, for their welfare, for their uh, uh, dignity, kinds of that. So even though they are the uh, small farmer, they are the ethnic group, or they are the monk, or any kinds of that, they can educate, uh, they can access to education with the uh, uh, MOOC base, uh, meaning that uh, open and embedded by technology. So you see that. So the still, some of our group, they still cannot, uh, very, got very difficult to access to the education. So the expertise is a center that I'm the director of that. Uh, our duty is how can we make all the more simplified accessibility and affordability to all our people. So we decide this Thai MOOC, uh, 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 that's called uh, Thai Yung. Yung means uh, the, the trunk the trunk of or the half of knowledge or the half of food kind of that. That is uh, the local dialect of the Thai. So we decide this kind of the most uh, simple uh, educational platform for our people. So meaning that even though they are taxi driver, they are the, 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 the uh, small farmer, they are anyone in, in, in Thailand, they can access to our flexible education that we provide for them, kind of that. This is example that uh, we use uh, our uh, online education or flexible education to serve the ethnic group in the north of Thailand. So they work, they learn, and then uh, they can uh, 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 taking care of their family at the same time, and then they can earn a living, and then they can access to any kinds of relevant uh, info information for their life. So this is an example of uh, uh, what we are doing, flexible learning. And uh, by this year, since last year, we have do a lot of technology embedded uh, into the education. Uh, yes, we are Buddhism country, so meaning that uh, uh, we have a big number of monks, that is a big population that need education, especially the Bali Sanskrit kind of that. That is the language of Buddhism. So uh, our university has served the uh, education for for this religious group by doing the MOOC and then train them and then uh, flexi, flexi, flexible them and simplify them into the mobile devices, especially the smartphone to help them. So we work as a partner to our group of people. So by this year, the, the monk can be accessed to mobile education to study the religious language by about 50,000 at the minimum kind of that. And then along the way, we also, the, uh, by this year, we, uh, our government announced to be the national agenda, national flagship uh, of the aging society. So meaning that the, uh, Thailand has announced the, the flagship, national flagship of the aging society together with the, the UN uh, decades of healthy aging. So meaning that the, our university has a duty to embed technology into the, into the physical training of the health caregiver in Thailand. So this is an ongoing project that we, how can we use technology to magnifying to 
to scaling up this kind of uh, fundamental knowledge to to taking care of themselves as the aging person and taking care of the the community with the certified practices. So this is what uh, our university is planning now with a lot of uh, partners collaboration. And then uh, by the down, most down south of Thailand, we, we like in, in Mindanao, we have a lot of uh, special group that is uh, the problem of the accessibility kind of that. So the, our university, our research center have trained them to use simplified technology to access them to all kinds of first education, certified education, second earn a living and security kinds of that. So this is uh, the how we educate them with the technology embedded. And then another special group that we use is kind of the handicap groups and also kinds of the 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 the, the prisoner that is uh, the one that stay behind the wall or stay behind the bar. So we educate them by using the technology to uh, facilitate their education. We use offline server to educate the 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 the, the prisoner in jail to make it uh, uh, possible once they uh, get free from the jail from the prison, they can have enough education to confront with the real world. So the, this is the education that our university has support to to the people in our group of that. So I would like to say that uh, by the technology, by the what what our the previous speaker has shared that uh, our Sukhothai Thammathilat of Open University, we try to look aloud and then try to use technology at the best we can because we are the only university of ODL in, in Thailand. So our duty is how can we use technology to convey education, uh, meaningful education to our people. So this is, this is the how. So I would like to say thanks uh, and honor for, for uh, Simeo and you all to have a, a chance to join with you. And then uh, we do hope that uh, with the support from our family of Simeo, our program of 100% online of communication for ASEAN would be got support for you all. Is this very new normal academy that fit with the free, fit, fit with the, 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 the flexible learning? Thank you so much, Kapun Maka. Kapun Ka, Professor Kamora, for your interesting presentation. So we move on to the next speaker from Vietnam, Dr. Bin Tuan Long. May I introduce him to you all? He is the Director of Technology and Learning Materials Center of Hanoi Open University, Vietnam. His experience includes information technology, instructional design, multimedia, and e-learning. And he is also the person in charge of e-learning infrastructure and e-learning development at Hanoi Open University. Please, sir, you may have the floor now. The audio is still off. Dr. Dins, you're out now. Okay. Okay, let me check. Okay, I can hear you now. You can hear me? Yes. Okay, okay please. Okay, good, uh, good morning, everyone. Excellency, distinguished guests, and ladies and gentlemen. Today, I'm very honored to be here to participate in an international conference uh, organized in a very special way, like this, to make a small contribution to supporting online educational. Can you uh, see my slide? Everything is okay? Yes, everything's okay, please. Okay, and in my very short uh, presentation, I would like to share some of our experience and start a discussion. Uh, in uh, order to find out the reason for some uh, unsuccessful online learning of school and university uh, through the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we have just started online learning recently in the effort of helping students not to go to school, but uh, not to stop learning. Uh, firstly, uh, 
Uh, we all know that COVID-19 is a medical crisis and it led to a lot of influence on uh, everyday activity. Both of country now have implemented uh, social isolation to reduce inflex infection in the community. Uh, Non-essential product factories go, uh, reduce public transportation, school close, and uh, I think it's, we can see this kind of image uh, everywhere. Most of uh, Vietnam mm, mm, school had uh, closed for a long time. And uh, also to maintain education, the implementation of e-learning becomes the only one option. Uh, in the uh, current period, e-learning is not a new issue and had been mentioned by many scholars uh, being uh, deployed in many places. However, Perhaps people think it's simple, and this is the most basic reason of all problems arising now. To, uh, let's take a look uh, at the school. Uh, we all know that uh, all school closed. So, uh, most of the country try to provide several kinds of uh, e-learning to keep on edu education uh, uh, in our country and in Vietnam. Uh, we provide lessons through television and uh, some uh, kind of uh, students are using Zoom or Teams or Meet, Google Meet. And uh, we, uh, they are teaching something like uh, we are doing now. It's uh, making an uh, online conference. And firstly, they, all of them think it's very simple and they uh, try to think that it will be very successful. But uh, to improve communication between teachers and students, a lot of teachers try using social networks like Facebook, WhatsApp, Viber, Zalo, and ready to answer all the questions of students. They, uh, they think, uh, we think that uh, it's not uh, enough. Because uh, firstly, uh, after several uh, weeks doing online learning, uh, the first, first time everything seemed okay. They think they can do e-learning easily and successfully. But after some time passed, there are many issues appear. We easily find out a lot of complaints about online learning in the newspaper everywhere. I'm not sure in your country, but in Vietnam, we uh, get this this kind of uh, issue. Uh, for example, uh, this is difficult to manage the online classroom, especially when it expands the number of students. Teachers have to know what, uh, what do the students do. Uh, are they learning or doing something else? More time, teaching becomes transfer knowledge one way and have to manage the quality control. Teachers who are using a social network find out that they need to work harder than ever. They need to check message every time. And after a long time, not only the teacher, also the student is very hard to find. What does they communicate with teacher because of massive message in their phone? Uh, when the students study by themselves at home, there are so many things can happen and disruption their lesson. If they haven't got their own quiet plate, quiet plate anything happen can interrupt the learning process. And uh, there, there, there is a trust that many people do not understand about the online learning, uh, including teacher and student. Uh, on, all of us are here, uh, are come from the Open University, so we, we understand about the e-learning and we know how to uh, organize e-learning. But uh, when we do it in the, for the public and more of the, when more of the school apply e-learning, it uh, will be the problem. For K-12, uh, for example, for K-12, especially the elementary school, not only students, but parents need to join the learning process. Uh, help students to join class, read and send messages to teacher. Uh, it spend time and not all of the parents can do it well for a long time. Uh, there are many complaints from parents because they are too tired to helping students. Another issue is very difficult to assess the quality of learning online because the technical issue. For example, we cannot authorize the learner uh, or not easy to control student computer while they are doing something online test. Uh, we, 
in HOU, uh, we uh, do some kind of uh, we we uh, after student finish their uh, learning and we make some examination for final and uh, we are using uh, when we uh, we need to use uh, online we apply the our test and we uh, we also using uh, Google Meet and doing some oral test but um, not on subject we can do something like that and uh, prove the student are up here in they are doing their test or another doing and lastly is the whenever we apply massive online learning there will be security and safety issue up here for example uh, in in vietnam uh, and uh, sometimes we talking about they they warning about using zoom and uh, whenever we using it or uh, in vietnam there also some group in Facebook where students can share their Zoom meeting code and password and invite strangers to join their online classroom. A teacher not skilled enough cannot uh, solve that situation and sometimes it's, uh, interruption the class, their lesson. And the reason, what is about the reason? Uh, most of us are here uh, all agree that the online learning, distance learning is very good and it's the future method of learning. But why? There are so many difficulties like that up here. In our research, we uh, point out some reasons. Firstly, it's experience. Most of the school and university who have just deployed online learning in the time of COVID-19 have no experience in online learning. They just have some simple knowledge and got short introduction from technology company. And and we all know that technology company, they don't know uh, what school uh, needs and uh, what uh, happened in school. So that can lead to many wrong actions while implement online learning. Uh, the second, teacher haven't got appropriate uh, pedagogy for online teaching. We know that e-learning can replace more action in traditional lesson, but we need to change to make it suitable. Most of the school and university using uh, synchronous e-learning and have no suitable learning material. And uh, one other reason is most of the school and university we have just started online learning because it's uh, for very short time, only about one or two weeks for pre preparation. So they haven't got their own learning management system. They are only using free service like Google Classroom, Teams, and most, mostly have nothing. Uh, besides the school, the government also have no special regulation on online learning. For example, in Vietnam, Ministry of Education and Training recognizes that and uh, still is the process of making new regulation about the online learning. How to teaching, how to learning, how to assess learning process, uh, how to do the examination, how to recognize student learning results. That's very important and all school uh, can base on that to build their uh, regulation. And uh, maybe last reason is students don't understand correctly about the method. Most of them are familiar with the passive learning method, uh, like uh, uh, initiative and don't know how to learn by themselves. And when they join the online classroom, uh, they, they only join the synchronous e-learning and haven't got the e, uh, asynchronous e-learning. This means that there are no, uh, no material and only uh, uh, synchronous, only meeting the teacher through some kind of conference. Uh, so how is the solution? Uh, we think that based on our experience, we suggest several solutions for that issue. It's great awareness about online learning method and deployment model for school leader, uh, learner, teacher, and student. Uh, all the university and school need to investment uh, in uh, to uh, for dedicated LMS system, and they need to connect, expand to quickly build a warehouse of shared material and document. We can connect uh, school and university to uh, quickly have that kind of uh, share material because uh, we, we need to say that because in Vietnam we haven't got uh, that kind of uh, OER system and uh, we recommend uh, to propose the government to have national regulation and standard for online training.
uh, training and guide for teacher and student on how to teach and learn online. We uh, need to promote the information about the meaning, method, way of online learning to family and society. And uh, this, this is very important because uh, if we cannot uh, explain the, the online e-learning and uh, online learning and e-learning to uh, social uh, in the near future, sometimes they will think that the uh, e-learning is not very good and not effective. And uh, in my conclusion, we have several conclusions is that COVID-19 is what a pandemic causing a lot of uh, influence on educational and training, but also it's, it's an opportunity for online training. Uh, even there are still some uh, issues, but after uh, school and universities they, uh, implement their e-learning, uh, there are several people from that still uh, uh, think that e-learning will be the future uh, learning method for education. Uh, the second is that if we implement correctly and uh, methodic, uh, methodically, it will be a big step of education and training. Uh, the involvement of education policy maker and the change is in awareness of school leader is needed. Uh, school need proper investment and connectivity to share uh, share resources to other to make it uh, the really future learning method. And uh, this is all of my presentation. And thank you for your listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Din Tuan Long, for your presentation. It was a very good sharing. So now we are with our last speakers, Dr. Eun Yong Kim. She is a research fellow in Korean Educational Development Institute, or KEDI. She has been involved in various higher and international education projects at both national and international levels. And she hopes. She holds a directorial position of Office of Public Relations and International Affairs of KD. So without further ado, the floor is yours, ma'am. Oh, um, my name is Eun Young Kim. Thank you uh, for, let me change my slides into the slideshow. Can you see my slides now? Not yet. Oh. Let me try one more time. I can see clearly now. Dr. Kim, can you yeah. uh, say something? Okay. We want to check. So you cannot sound. really see my slides, but I will try to um, give you my presentation then. Okay. Well, we can so see your today, slides now. You can see my slides now. Yes, I can. Right. Okay, good. Today, I want I wanted to share two points: uh, Korea's education responses to the COVID nineteen pandemic, focusing on online classes and the role of teacher and training and then emerging issues. Some of the issues has been already discussed and delivered. Next slide. Could you move to our next slides? This was strange. Okay. So um, some of the issues already uh, delivered and discussed by other presenters who presented uh, um, earlier. Uh, Korea already started uh, online classes for students um, from uh, first grader to the 12th grader uh, since May. Uh, in order to have that uh, kind of um, implementation, we had to uh, prepare certain uh, features in terms of hardware. So in order to provide uh, the online classes, there were two purposes to provide online classes. One is to ensure the health and safety of the students because of the pandemic. We maintained our social distance policy. 
and then to protect students' right to education access. Like all other countries, Korea also um, have a very high uh, enthusiasm regarding education. That's why um, the demand from schools, uh, parents were very high to continue maintain the education. But online classes, some uh, infrastructure has to be established because the one that we had was not sufficient to maintain stable education uh, quality. So one was the expansion of public infrastructure. So we um, e-learning site, but they had to increase the seven-fold of expansion of e-learning site. And then this materials has been increased for 300-fold. So think about how much uh, work has been done by the government and the teachers and other people. And the new EBS TV channels newly created. So before we had broadcast TV channels, but in order to provide education, um, online education, they increased the number of channels from seven to 12 for elementary and secondary education school students and provide free online learning resources. They temporarily relaxed a bit copyrights application for education purpose. I'm gonna talk, talk about this later. Could you move to next slides, please? Okay, so these are the types of online classes, but um, as other uh, presenters in, uh, put it different, different way, but there are two types, uh, real-time interactive classes and one-way classes. So real-time interactive classes are allow immediate exchange of feedback with the students including real-time communication by using video conferencing on online platforms like this. And one-way classes are content-oriented and task-oriented. One is lecture. So teach, students watch video recorded lecture content and then learn contents uh, through the video uh, learning. And teachers monitor students' learning and provide feedbacks. Lecture plus activity. Students watch the video recorded learning content and engage in discussion by leaving comments on asking and answering questions with their peers. So these are the component and task oriented uh, progress students have made to meet achievement standards of each subject through self directed learning and give task sense. Said that say about forty percent of the uh, of the uh, classes, and they some and most of the teachers said that they come. And as a teacher, I have uh, just how long say with uh, with education system. If you see the slides, the schools. They plan for online classes and grades and subject. Weekly plan for online classes. So teach. And so how they're going to uh, provide uh, online class and they online classes uh, daily and give feedback, evaluation, and record keeping. Uh, what we do is my we uh, relaxed a bit of a social distance, but because we haven't completely get over the COVID-19 yet, um, students uh, uh, phase out going to school. For example, my daughter, who is in seventh grade now, seventh grade now, she goes to school for one week, and for other graders like. Uh, eight and nine grader students stay home. So for she goes to school for one week and then for last uh, for next two weeks, she stay home, but she takes the classes from online based on the scheduled plan. And teacher student interactions can take place in here. But if you see this systematic approaches, a lot of works are involved for teachers, right? So let me, can you go to the next slide, please? Okay. 
role of teachers under COVID-19. They develop learning content, teach classes, guide and help students to adapt new learning environments, and they carry out administrative works. So they have to, because um, uh, they cannot really st uh, under, uh, see the students face to face, a lot of uh, information has to be gathered because um, sometimes individual students, health conscious, I mean, all the students has to report their um, conditions every morning. So then teachers develop, uh, carried out all the uh, teachers um, has to promote or call, call students if they fail to report their health conditions. And sometimes because of a lot of things are done online, they have more work to um, commun communicate with parents. And because this is a newer situation, new situation, we have to gather a lot of data information on schools and teachers are the main data collector initial data collector from students or homes and schools so they have a lot of administrative works and although ict is not a new uh environment we we think that we are quite familiar with the ict environment but learning environment is quite different because um we are very accustomed to the traditional learning environment that takes place in school, in class, in classroom, face to face. So in order to open the website to access to certain features of online classes, and that can be done by teachers. And link education offices and school districts, schools and students and parents, this is what they have to do. So KMO provide a very big picture, very uh, broad guidelines. And each regional school education offices or school districts, they have their government uh, curriculum implementation plan and they provide uh, guard, uh, guidelines, very detailed guidelines. And they have to provide them or implement them in class within schools. And these are a lot of work I heard and participate in various learning communities and adapt themselves to the new learning environment. Meaning, teachers um, have a lot of experiences teaching in, um, in, in a traditional classroom. They do, not, they do not necessarily equip with the necessary competencies or uh, necessary, necessary, necessary competencies on how to um, manage or operate online classes. So they have to learn themselves. And, okay, I thought I would, I mean, I wish I, prepared, I had a prepare for um, the teacher, online teacher uh, training that are provided by the government, regional government, or a voluntary teacher um, community, learning communities. So for example, um, they change most of the teacher training programs or teacher training programs into online this year. And in order to provide certain experiences and um, information, government provided a website, they prepared the website called School On. And there are other websites that was voluntarily established, which it was Teacher On. So Teacher On is they provide, if teachers have any difficulties and they share the information and they give answers, and sometimes they provide real-time troubleshooting. Share the best practices. And this, I heard that this is a very uh, effective way of um, improving online classes, regarding online classes. And at the same time, um, what regional offices and school commissioners notice is that the quality are so different depending on the teachers or depending on the schools or this organizational culture of the schools. So what they did was they um, identified classrooms. Sometimes they recorded and they share that experience to other schools. And sometimes they invite um, teachers who are very good at uh, online teaching and uh, help other school teachers to learn about that or 
Sometimes they encourage teachers to participate in online classes, the real-time online classes that are supposed to be um, the model cases. And through that kind of um, learning by doing methodologies, they um, carry out online classes. Um, because I, I, I was heard that I have only eight minutes. Uh, I didn't really prepare a lot, but if you have any questions, I can give you information um, through email. And we have, uh, Korean government prepared the manuals and guidelines, uh, maybe too many. So if you want to learn about the Korean uh, responses to the on regarding online classes for the COVID-19 pandemics, uh, please contact me. Thank you. Hello. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Kim, uh, for your presentation. So now, uh, with that, with Dr. Kim's presentation finished, we will go ahead and take some time for question and answer sessions. It looks like uh, we have a few questions already, operator. If you please share the slide of selected questions. We have two questions. The first one is for Dr. Edison Permin. And the second question will go to the rest three presenters, Dr. Kim, uh, Dr. Kamal Raj, and Dr. Dean. The first one for Dr. Edison Permin, can you Hi. give us an example of project-based learning? How does it differ from a modular approach? This is from Ms. Bella Mayo, please. Sure, uh, let, let me just uh, share with you my screen, if I can do that, please. Maybe may I be allowed to share my screen now? I'll show you an actual sample that you can actually make use of in your respective uh, institutions. So allow me to uh, just access it. Somebody tell me if you can hear me now. Sorry, I got this a little. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. So sorry about that. Uh, let me just transition back to the PowerPoint screen. So as I was saying earlier before we were cut, the distinction between project-based learning and module-based learning uh, is quite easy to know. Remember that in projects, you need to be integrating several learning outcomes across uh, courses or subjects, but modules are typically uh, very much uh, constrained only by learning outcomes per subject or course. In project-based learning, content is focused based on the learner's declaration of what he or she wants to learn or discover. And in modular learning, content is focused based on required reading. A lot of self-paced exploration happens in PBL, while in MBL or module-based learning, you still have a lot of guided and routine learning experiences. PBL is concentrated heavily on authentic and reflective assessments, while MBL is still heavy on formative and summative assessments. On the screen, I'm showing you uh, what we call creating uh, by creating project-based learning units, where you integrate uh, learning outcomes that um, that are called from several disciplines and can create a context for meaningful learning. So here you see the learning outcomes of science, math, communication arts, social science, values education, and even entrepreneurship education. The goal of the teachers of these subjects is to engage students in real life learning experiences where they get to solve the problems even remotely. An example of which where all these learning outcomes can be learned is in the project-based learning unit where they get to answer the question, what can you do 
with what is typically wasted as plant parts. So the context is created through that project, and this is the context that we did for the British Council uh, some years back. It's entitled Food for Thought, Thought for Food, where the context says that we need to feed 9 billion people, and we put to waste every day a lot of food, vegetable parts, which may have nutritive value. The question is, in what ways can they still be used? Now, someone also asked the question, how can you do remote laboratory learning experiences? This is my way of telling you that PBL is also an answer to remote laboratory learning experiences. Here, when the student is asked to create his or her project learning plan, take note, the experience is co-designed by the learner with the teacher. When the teacher prompts the student, here is the problem, what do you think will have to be known as concepts and what would be some skills or procedures that you need to do to propose a solution to this problem? And then in, in, in terms of accessing content, let's say the students have realized one of the wasted plant parts uh, typically out there is the core of the pineapple. The student can actually elect that project and research on why the core of the pineapple is important. So this is where a lot of self-paced exploration happens, especially when the student finds out that the core of the pineapple contains bromelain. It actually can help those uh, uh, people with some digestive problems, and even those who have some problems conceiving children. Do you know that when you eat the core of the pineapple, you increase the cervical mucus? Just a trivia that I want to share with you because I'm fond of science as well. So in this project, what happened was we used design thinking principles for the students to launch their projects. So it's not clear on your screen, but you're seeing the students experimented, experimented on their own recipes for creating something out of wasted plant parts. So they create the recipe. Remember, we are teaching via the communication arts procedural discourse, and this is where they get to use them. And then they carry out the experiment by finding out how they can extract uh, something from the wasted plant parts. In this case, these students were extracting alternative flour from wasted plant parts. And they looked at the squash peel, the pineapple core, the sweet potato peel, and the mango peel. Ordinarily, in your laboratories, that's where they can do this. But in the comforts of their homes, they can also do these experiments on their own. And if they're lucky enough, they can actually create some food items from them. Like the alternative floor you extracted from these wasted plant parts that can be used for what we call squash peel cake, sweet potato cake, pineapple core cake, and mango peel cake. So no food is wasted. But wait, there's more. We did this remote learning experiences because we also want to engage the learners in adopting an entrepreneurial consciousness. Simeo is a champion of entrepreneurship education and we support this cause. So we pose the question to the students, how will you introduce your project as a means of livelihood? What considerations for financing will be important? And how will this benefit your community? So at the end of the learning period, those learning outcomes are evidenced in terms of achievement using a portfolio. The portfolio is produced by the students and that portfolio is transmitted to the school to the teachers and are evaluated. And from there, the learning continues. So this is my example of project-based learning, which also contains a lot of opportunities for doing remote scientific laboratory experiences. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was very comprehensive, Dr. Fermin. So next question for our three panelists. This is from Siti Aina Makaumbao. As a science teacher, laboratory activity is a part of curriculum. How can we possibly continue doing it by flexible learning? Any tips or alternative ideas? So may I call Professor Kamalrat first to answer the question. Thank you so much for a very uh, challenging question. Actually, the I think that the, this, this question is uh, could be kind of uh, uh, make it uh, easy. First, I think that uh, we need to, as the teacher or the facilitator, we need to understand all the change. So once we once we understand the change and then we accept the change, and then after that, the second step is uh, 
we we need to uh, change our mindset that uh, our technology uh, that uh, right now the technology can be facilitate any kinds of the new learning system. So meaning that once the teacher change and then they accept the the the, the technology and innovation, and then the third one they decide the 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 learning ecosystem to make our learning ecosystem to be uh, human humanism and uh, uh, embedded technology into that. For example, that that uh, 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 in the laboratory or the practice space, we decide uh, we decide the 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 the, the trainer uh, the trainer at the at the project base. And then once we, we decide the trainer, and then uh, we also the, uh, decide the the the, the uh, learning material to be more uh, less responsive to the to train to train the practices. For example, like uh, how to change the mindset of the teacher from the previous physical training to be the 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 virtual training or the virtual practice kind of that so the we are under undergoing of uh, experimented this challenging so the uh, as I, I say in conclusion that we change the mindset of the teacher and then we decide the interactive and innovative pedagogy and then we test along the way we train all the all the ecosystem partner in in the practice way so everyone can participate and take part in that uh, laboratory or practices base. So that's that's my answer. Yes. Thank you, Professor Morat. Now, uh, can we hear uh, the answer from uh, Dr. Dean Tuanlo, please? Yeah. <laughs> This is uh, the very, uh, I think this is a very uh, interesting question. And uh, because for the laboratory activity, uh, we all think that it's not easy to, uh, to do the flexible learning for that kind of uh, education. But uh, in fact, there are many kind of, there are many kind of uh, labor, uh, laboratory action. For example, for, for science uh, subject like IT, we think that uh, we all think that for the IT we can easily do the uh, flexible learning for students because uh, most of the activity uh, happen in the in the computer and we can uh, make it. But for the other, but for the other, for example, in uh, in Vietnam uh, and uh, even HOU. We uh, we also doing making some uh, subject for uh, cooking, and for for this kind of um, uh, subject, we uh, we try to make the content. Uh, we try to uh, to to make the content to to uh, understand what the uh, uh, the procedure to make something. For example, uh, when the teacher cooking, uh, when the teacher do the cooking, we take the video and uh, besides the video, we, uh, we have the guiding, the very uh, detailed guiding to student. And after that, whenever we, we want to check the student, uh, the student need to record video by themselves to do something. And after that, uh, they send the video to teacher and the, uh, the teacher can uh, based on the student's video and give some uh, recommend or uh, something, some, uh, some uh, comment on the video. And after that, the student can uh, gain uh, experience by themselves. And I think that uh, we cannot do all. We, we also think that we cannot do all. But uh, most of them, we can do some uh, some kind of flexible learning for that kind of subject. And uh, for the high technology, we can make some simulation, uh, some kind of 3D simulation. And uh, or we can apply the AR, VR for that kind of subject. 
but uh, I don't think it uh, can be popular because it requires the university need to um, invest more to make that kind of subject. But for most uh, simple laboratory activity, we can do, uh, we can try to do it through the video. So that, that's my, uh, that, that's my idea about the laboratory uh, teaching in a flexible way. Okay, thank you, Dr. Dean, uh, for your re response to the question. Now we will hear the next answer from uh, Dr. Kim, please. Okay, I would like to second what my Vietnamese colleague said. The very first thing I had in my mind was videotape, videotaping the step-by-step -step laboratory uh, experience that done. So, um, one teacher actually collect some of the little insects or the plants to show students their functions and their features, those so um, uh, animals and plants. And if it, it involved in uh, chemical uh, laboratory, any kind of experiments that has to be done in science classes, my first uh, option would be the videotaping. And if you have a luxury of uh, having certain number of students in class if you don't have to collect every students in one classes and then you can do the small group uh, experiments with uh, with students um, that's that's something that I would do I would do in Korea because I'm conducting a higher education uh, research spent focusing on um, their learning, the process of teaching and learning. And one of the most challenging area of study is involving the practicum or the real practices in, in, in classes. And for those uh, who are enrolled in uh, education or, uh, or enrolled in arts or the um, art, arts and musics, they have no choice but uh, having the students one by one, having one one-on-one -on -one, uh, lecture with the professor. And I think I'm very interested in what would happen, what, what, what it would be the student's experience, experience as, um, on staying home and do not participating in, in, the, um, in class uh, learning. So that's it, yes. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Kim. Uh, it looks like we have no more time for question and answer session. Thank you for your interest and enthusiasm in joining uh, our session. So, and also please excuse us for not being able to respond to our participants' comments and, and questions uh, as we receive so many in YouTube comment box. But we did best as we can. Yeah. So we are now moving to our next agenda, which is a closing remarks by Dr. Raimundo. E.R. Siga, the Executive Director of ALCO Philippines. The floor is yours, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you clearly. A pleasant afternoon. On behalf of our president, uh, of the Associate Colleges and Universities, Dr. Rene Colocar, and also formed on behalf of uh, Dr. Laurel, the L uh, president of Lyceum of the Philippines University, where I'm presently working as resource person. We would like to thank uh, Simeo, Alco, and Alcocoa for hosting this kind of event. I hope you'll agree with me, you know, for the last uh, six weeks, We've been uh, viewing a lot of discussion, seminar, talks about flexible learning. And uh, today's uh, session uh, gave us a little confirmation whether we've, what we've been doing the last six months, the last six weeks, no, uh, is what we call uh, flexible learning. Uh, today's session, and I hope everyone will agree, uh, gave us an opportunity to enhance our institutional framework on how we can implement uh, flexible learning come August of 2019. Also, this session uh, gave us the confidence to draw 
the roadmap in the implementation of flexible learning. And most importantly, um, it helped us to reconcile differing thoughts um, on flexible learning. And I would want to believe, as I always tell my friend, Dr. Ed Fermin, uh, we've discovered uh, the vaccine to COVID-19 in higher education, even in basic education. Allow me to thank Dr. Carlo Magna. Thank you so much for allowing us to realize that flexible learning is not just about implementing it, that it's important for us to implement the same based on standards, that in developing the learning resources, um, in identifying pedagogy and uh, in facilitating uh, flexible learning, uh, there is a standard that we have to uh, comply with. We also would like to thank Dr. Paulina Pania for sharing with us that flexible learning is inviting everyone to implement the new learning process from learn, play, and eventually allow our students to research and produce. I'm also happy to hear from you, Dr. Paulina Panam, that you know it's not about how many technology we use, but how we use it. I like your uh, proposition that we should be more engaged in constructivist pedagogy, uh, differentiated strategy, and uh, autonomous learning. And uh, we're also happy to hear from you that no matter what happened, we have to ensure equity and access across all institutions. From Dr. Fermin, uh, thank you for reminding us again that in implementing flexible learning, it can never be exactly the same from one institution to the other because our flexible learning implementation will depend on the institutional priorities based on learning outcomes and based on the industry requirements. When industries, and not all students that you have right now are the same with that of other institutions, we have to put value on the institutional priorities, learning outcomes, and industry requirements. He also emphasized, thank you so much, Dr. Fermin, that today while we talk about outcomes, content, and experience, flexible learning is calling everyone to just put importance on what is essential outcome, what is essential content, and what is essential experience. For Dr. Kamal Rat, thank you for reminding us that flexible learning, nobody should be left behind. Flexible learning is about lifelong learning, and that flexible learning is what you call functional education with real value. Thank you also to Dr. Dean Huang Long from Vietnam. Thank you for helping us realize also in the Philippines that the problem that we have right now is just the same with other ASEAN countries. Thank you for sharing with us the challenges, difficulties, reasons, and most importantly, the solutions to the challenges posed by COVID-19. And from Dr. Yu Yong Kim from Korea, thank you for reminding us that more than anything else, we have to ensure the health and safety of our students. And thank you for reminding us that we have to protect students' right to education access. Most importantly, Dr. Yong Kim, um, thank you for enumerating with us the new role of teachers from learning contents, teaching in the class, from doing admin works, from linking education offices to other schools, districts, school students, and parents, and our obligation to participate in various learning activities to adapt ourselves to the new learning environment. There is only one thing clear, my dear participants, uh, teachers will not be replaced by technology, but teachers who do not use technology will be replaced by those who do. And let us be reminded that COVID-19 is about revolutionizing education. Revolution in education is necessary if we are to use the education in promoting equal opportunity and in building social capital. A revolution is necessary, according to Dr. Chavez. Even for good schools, the time to change is now. And change must not be merely reformative. It needs to be truly transformative, and that means revolutionary. Change has to be achieved first in the field of ideas, in our mindsets. Revolutionizing education, we must reconceive education. We must redefine learning and so reinvent schooling. And I just hope all of us now, after attending 
the Simeon webinar with Alku are all willing to stage this revolution. A pleasant afternoon to everyone and we wish everyone good luck as we embrace the new normal and as we implement the true meaning of flexible learning. Okay, Dr. Raimundo, we cannot hear your voice, sorry. Dr. Raimundo? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, now. You haven't heard from the start? You no, it was just lost connection for a while, but no, it's okay. You may continue. I don't know where I stopped, where you stopped not hearing me. So, <laughs> hello, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, now I can hear you. Yeah, again, uh, as I've been telling everyone, uh, this is my webinar with Alco. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, gave us the opportunity to enhance our uh, institutional framework to proceed with flexible learning. This session also gave us more confidence to um, you know, design roadmap in the implementation of flexible learning. And more, most importantly, the Simeo webinar with Alco um, helped us to reconcile differing uh, perspectives and school of thoughts about the implementation opportunity to discover the vaccine to COVID-19 in education. Allow me to thank Dr. Carlo Magno. Thank you for reminding us that implementing flexible learning, we should be reminded that there's a standard that we have to follow, that the implementation should start from the learning resources and will end from the monitoring and evaluation. We would like, we would like also to uh, thank Dr. Paulina Panem, no? for reminding us that flexible learning should not be the same with what we used to do in the past. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. But and uh, of course, thank you reminding us no, that the dual learning process, no, uh, it's not about how many technology you use, but how we use it. And thank you, Dr. Paulina Panem, no, for telling us that uh, in flexible learning, uh, we have to imbibe the values of equity and access across all institutions. And I'm course, sorry, Dr. Raimundo. I think uh, you have uh, you are repeating all the uh, your remarks. We have heard that. So I here, know, um, teachers part, will not be replaced by technology, but teachers do not use technology. So we will revolution in education is necessary if we are to use the education in promoting equal opportunity and in building social capital. A revolution, according to Dr. Chavez, is necessary. Even for good schools, the time to change is now. And change must not be merely reformative. It needs to be truly transformative, and that means revolutionary. Change has to be achieved first in the field of ideas, in our mindsets. Revolutionizing education, we must reconceive education. We must redefine learning, and so reinvent schooling. And thank you so much for all your willingness to stage this revolution. A pleasant afternoon to everyone. And we wish everyone good luck as you embrace the new normal and as you implement flexible learning in education. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. I think you also have helped to summarize our whole session to yeah, very informative remarks. Now, may I uh, hand over the session to Dr. Etel, uh, the senior secretariat director, to deliver appreciation words. Please, ma'am, you may have a few. Thank you very much, uh, Alku, our partner in this joint webinar. This is actually our 10th webinar session. So uh, let me just give a quick overview of this particular webinar session. We focus on flexible learning, as many are already asking about flexible learning options. So what we have gathered from all the speakers are really very good from the definition of Dr. Fermin, but let me just reiterate the, the flexible learning is a range of learning modes. You have a choice of when, where, and how 
the kids will learn. It can be synchronous, it can be asynchronous, e-learning, online, collaborative, computer-based, project-based learning as discussed by our speaker, distance learning, computer-assisted learning. We also have uh, other learning programs such as uh, TV-based learning, radio-based learning. What we learned from Dr. Carlo today is uh, emphasizing on quality for flexible learning programs. So how did the Philippines, like Dr. Carlo, set up these uh, flexible learning plans, flexible learning standards in the light of preparation for Industry 4.0? Next, we also should, uh, should learn about next slide. Uh, flexible learning from Dr. Paulina by using flip-based, home-based learning option. Uh, technology is not the only problem that we should think of, but how we, teachers will increasingly use technology. And in some instances, teachers also have to visit the learners, as in the case of Cambodia, in the case of Laos, okay? Autonomous learning and differentiated strategy. So you can uh, make use of all the new learning paradigms that our speaker presented today. Well, you will always remember what Dr. Fermin said on the tips for doing flexible learning programs and capturing it with Simeo. It should be student-centered. It should be accessible. It should be adjusted to the context. Uh, it should maximize the content that uh, everybody learns from this pandemic, learner engagement and assessment for uh, learners that are applicable and uh, opening all lines of communication, whether you use uh, you know, your Telegram, Facebook, and other sources. So uh, I like the presentation of Dr. Fermin as well on product and process and place. Uh, I am touched by the presentation of, of uh, Thailand because it's really for all, flexible learning for every Thais. So it's about functional education with real value for their life and for their living. So they use hybrid training, MOOC platforms for everyone, farmers, students, lifelong learners. Next. Uh, from Hanoi, well, the Hanoi Open University presentation give, give us all the benefits of online learning but also challenges, which I think all of us face because of, you know, not being prepared for online learning. Uh, while you use social network, you can manage your online classroom, but some children could not really focus on flexible learning modalities. There is no understanding sometimes because actually the teachers could really not be replaced. Face-to-face -face teaching is really something that is important. But we, given the situation we are in, there are solutions according to Hanoi Open University. You can use all the available platforms, Google, uh, Moodles, and Moodle, all of these that, you know, at, at the Open Universities, they consistently use. But we also have to think about, you know, assessment and learning at this time. So Dr. Dean presented opportunities for online training for teachers who would like to better understand how to do it. So you can look at our CBOOCs because we also offer uh, some global digital literacy concepts there. And please visit our online resources, which we co-share with Anna Open University. Dr. Kim, you have given me uh, an information that, you know, Korea also uh, invested on public infrastructure, which is actually a concern of all Southeast Asian. And even using uh, TV channels, uh, for for the for this particular COVID-19 pandemic situation and response for flexible learning. And your government also offers free online courses and expanded e-learning sites. Well, that's really good from the uh, whole government approach to flexible learning that there is support as, uh, from, from infrastructure to TV channels and online learning. And uh, by the way, uh, the key message here is whenever you select the flexible learning, you should think of the appropriate pedagogy, the appropriate platform or space, and the appropriate technology. So because many, many uh, schools have already tried, you know, uh, adjusting to Industry 4.0, but now it was pushed because of the pandemic. Uh, we are 
transitioning, but at the same time, it's so fast. Uh, so I think that that everybody should be adaptable. That the situation should be flexible. That we should always consider whatever is the appropriate context that will be used for flexible learning. Please visit our open educational resources, our online resources. There are a lot of information on flexible learning shared by our partners and senior secretariat. And actually, all of us are learning because this pandemic never happened before. So the learning curve is there, and we wish you all the best. Thank you very much, Dr. Etel, for the synthesis and the key messages. Yeah, and. Uh, my high appreciation also goes to all of our speakers who have presented today and enlightened all participants with good sharing of practices of flexible and technology-mediated learning in their countries. Yeah? Hopefully, it will inspire all educators who join this webinar to implement in their own institutions. Now, before we close this event, may I invite my colleague Rafi from Simeon Secretariat to share about the webinar certificate. Please, Rafi. Thank you so much, Ali. So I know that uh, most of our participants on YouTube are asking about our e-certificate. So allow me to share the process of uh, securing the e-certificate for this webinar. First, participants will need to fill up the certificate validation and assessment form after watching the webinar. So you can see the link on the lower right part of the screen together with the QR code. And you will need to provide us a reflection on how to apply the knowledge from this webinar, 50 to 150 words. So when you click that link, you will be taken to an online forum where you will submit your reflection. The third bullet is very important. Please ensure that the spelling of your full name and email address are both correct prior to submission because we will be basing your e-certificate on your full name and we will be sending it using the email address that you have given us. The e-certificate will be sent to your email on or before the 31 of July, 2020. And please note that the, that the deadline to submit the e the reflection is on June 24, 11 p.m. and that is Bangkok time. And for inquiries, please email us at webinar at cbo.org. So we'd also like to invite all our participants to log in and register for our next webinar on embracing new normal and the future of work. So this will be on June 25, 2020, 10 a.m. to 11.30. This time it is GMT plus 7. So to our participants in Manila, in Singapore, in Malaysia, that will be on a different time because we are on GMT plus 8. So the, re the registration link can also be seen on the lower left part together with the QR code and the live on YouTube link. Thank you so much for participating in our senior webinar series and we hope to see you next week for another learning session. Thank you and good morning or good afternoon wherever our participants may be. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you also. Thank you, Mom. Thank you, Mamet, and thank you, everyone.
Thank you very much to all our speakers.